I am so excited to have Jay Martin on today. He is the CEO of Cambridge House and has hosted some of the largest investment conferences in North America. This gives him a unique opportunity to talk to some of the most important thought leaders from all over the world. And I love that he has people on, whether he agrees with them or disagrees with them, but to have that discourse. He's the host of The Jay Martin Show, a top-rated podcast, YouTube channel, and a weekly newsletter that discusses investment trends and psychology with 250,000 plus highly engaged listeners, viewers, and readers. Today, we got to talk about civil discourse and personal sovereignty, precious metals, and the importance of community. I know you're going to enjoy this interview. So without further ado, here it is. Jay, it's been great. I haven't seen you since February and had a great time on your show. And I'd like to really thank you for coming here today. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure, Lynette. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Well, you know, you're very accomplished. And I'd like to start by asking what motivates you to have built the business that you've built and to do what you do. Oh, cool. Um, well, a few things. I mean, I got three core reasons at home. They are one, three, and five years old. So that definitely <laughs> helps, right? Yeah. And um, I'm really fortunate, Lynette. Like, I, I really love what I do. You know, I every week I author my letter and it's the highlight of my week. I get to, I treat my newsletter like my backyard. I talk about whatever I want to talk about. You know, I don't have any rules. I don't owe anybody anything. It's really just my creative space where I share thoughts on whatever current events or, you know, just honestly like social trends, anything that's catching my eye that I want to share some thoughts on. And, and all of my content kind of reflects that, you know, the podcast, the YouTube channel, we've got a big event in Vancouver next week. And it's, it's all based off of like, it's all very self-serving, right? The content I create answers the questions that I have. I mean, really at its core, to be honest with you. And, and all of the seminars that you do, you know, really bring you and, and your work on your YouTube, et cetera, really brings you in contact with global thought leaders on all of these different topics. So it's the best. Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely the best. So I, I wanted to ask you, you did a recent tweet. Gold was under a thousand in 2008 when Bear Stearns collapsed. As the crisis matured, gold fell to 700. You said that you couldn't remember what happened next. <laughs> so I thought, let's talk about that. Cause I do, re <laughs> I do remember that really, really well. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I felt like teasing the market a little bit this morning. I mean, you know, it's, it's March, May 10th today, right? The sky is falling. Everything is falling. It's not <laughs> bolted down. It's getting sold, right? Cash right. falls everywhere. And, um, and you know, my favorite asset classes are where I gravitate towards in general, not just in times like this, I think we're actually, you know, very similar. I've learned a lot of, of mm -hmm. how I uh, build my portfolio from yourself, Lynette, and a lot of your oh, peers, right? Thank you. mm -hmm. Heavyweight precious metals for reasons like this. Yes. But, um, you know, we get so reactive in the market, don't we? Especially in the Twitter, Twitter sphere, right? Oh, and yeah. We look at like day over day price changes and even week over week and really lose sight of like, what's the time horizon? You know? Okay, sure. We're down 10% today. Does it matter? What's your time horizon? And even even gold bugs with the, you know, most historically relevant asset class ever known to man, still sweat the short term price swings. Isn't and it's like, what, what are you doing here? Right. What's the time horizon? Right. So, yeah, it was a bit of a poke, you know, but uh, I'm bullish, obviously, on the precious metal sector. So I felt like sharing that. Well, and, and we should talk about that, because a lot of times when people see gold drop and they go, oh, what they don't realize is that's a spot gold market. And with all of the other markets dropping, there are going to be margin calls because so much of those stocks were bought on debt. And so when yeah. they fall below a threshold, then people are forced to sell in order to meet those margin calls. So yeah. 
I, I love the time horizon because anything can happen short term, but longer term, that's what you really have to look at. So what do you yeah. see? We had the conversation, you know, where I know what I think gold is going to in terms of fiat and ever so much higher than that. But what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I love your price prediction. I think if I'm correct, it was uh, it was 50,000 would be a fair valuation for an ounce of gold, right? Currently, currently. Currently, currently. There it is. Yeah. So, you know, where do I land on that? I think that's uh, my time horizon is long, right? I own mm -hmm. physical gold in my intention. So what's my time horizon? Well, my end goal is to give it to my kids and I pass away. So that gives you some perspective on my time horizon, right? When it comes to the physical gold that I am acquiring and hopefully will acquire for the rest of my life, right? It's um, it's a marathon for me. It's not a sprint. Um, right. And I will continue to accumulate, right? I buy more when the price drops. That's good for me, right? And it's something that I hope to leave to my children one day. That's the inheritance. So, you know, it's funny though, because I'm an investor. I know what kind of investor I am, right? I don't get confused and think I'm a trader. I don't think I'm a day trader. Right. I don't think I'm a swing trader. But the majority of financial media headlines are written for and by traders. And so they, they captivate even the investor audience. And they think all these, you know, bipolar headlines matter when they don't, right? But it's really easy to fall victim and get so reactive. You know, I did an exercise a couple of months ago where I just compared the front page of like Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal, I think routers, like day over day for like a 14 day period. And every day, you know, it's a bull market or it's a bear market. Like it's just guys, come on, like, let's just be realistic here, right? And I get it, right? Media is there to get you excited and click on that headline. They're going to do their job. But the investors in us, you know, I think we really serve ourselves if we're able to police those emotions, like police them well and immunize ourselves from those day-to-day, -day, you know, hyperbole, sensational driven headlines and just recenter, like what's the core focus here, right? And, um, you know, if you're playing the precious metals market like I am, yeah, I own physical and I own a ton of gold equities. And if I love the management teams of the companies that I'm buying, then that means that I trust them to weather the worst of storms. And if I've made that decision correctly, then events like we're experiencing this week don't make me lose sleep because I put my money behind who I believe are the top performing entrepreneurs in the precious metals business. And I trust them to have the experience and expertise to surround themselves, other great individuals to weather these kinds of storms and come out on top. And time and time again, that's proven correct. And, you know, that that is a really good strategy because what you've really done, too, between the physical and the intangible is you've created a truly diversified portfolio. And, you know, Wall Street, I mean, we've been trained short termism, right? I mean, you can't you can't hold your attention for 15 seconds. And yeah. so I think that we've really been taught to to focus on the short term because Wall Street makes more money if you keep trading, you know, 100%. 100%. And especially when so many in the world were given money during the, you know, pandemic, pandemic. And yeah. so they were home and what did they do? They traded and now those trades seem to be unraveling because yeah. they weren't value based and they weren't long term. It was just all of this short termism. Yeah, and that's really systemic, isn't it? Through our culture, whether you're looking at the media platforms that captivate us, you know, it, it's swipe culture, right? It's like, I want it now, it's on-demand culture. I also wanna be rich today, by the way, you know what I mean? And and so how can I do that? Well, I have to catch the right trade, right? Right. The traders always get wiped out, right? It's it is like maybe 0.01% that outperform the market over time. It's very, very small. And, uh, and you know their names, right? So that's why I tell people before you, start allocating cash to the market, the first step should be how much time do you have to invest in being an investor? Because right. if you have a nine to five or you run a small business, you got a family, all this stuff, like how much time do you actually have to focus on your portfolio? Because if it's two hours a day, don't try to day trade. First of all, my advice, never try to day trade. But if you want to, like it's a full-time gig and you have to really apply yourself and, and be, you know, there's a lot know, to so learn. It's a lot to learn, right? I have about two hours a day. That's it in my portfolio. And then my day runs away, right? I run a small business. I got, you know, a hundred things going on. The early morning though, or that's my sacred market time. And I can look at the decisions I've made, you know, feel good about where I'm at, look for opportunities, all this stuff, you know, 
cover some headlines, but, but after that I'm away. And so as a consequence, I'm in positions for, you know, six months at minimum, five years is not unusual. Oh, well, for me, they can be even way longer than that because there are foundational positions that you have in your portfolio and those, like you said earlier, you know, you've got some physical gold that you intend to leave to your children. That's yeah. a very long-term time horizon and so appropriate because physical gold is one of the legs of dynastic wealth. That's wealth that lasts in families at least 300 years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it enables you to weather all of these things that we're going in and it kind of takes you or takes us to a really key for you, which is that I'd like you to really address is your personal sovereignty. Sure. I mean, you know, that's the, it's the, the core purpose behind all the content I create. It, 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 it is what drives my portfolio. And honestly, what we call, you know, our, our epic family blueprint that my wife and I have created for, you know, our kids and our, our parenting mission, right? And I guess it's it's an understanding that nobody has your back. And that's a good thing because it puts you in the driver's seat mm -hmm. as long as you're willing to put the work in, right? But you have to take care of yourself. And this expands beyond wealth, by the way. We could talk about my portfolio. Oh. Mm -hmm. I included the, my, my refrigerator, my pantry, right? The food that's in there, right? We're not trusting what the FDA says. And that's not to say they're crooks. It's just, it's managing it to... <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about uh, yeah. that. It's it's an unrealistic expectation to think any governing body could have all of our best interest in mind when it comes to food, water, wealth, health. It doesn't matter, right? It's unrealistic. So don't don't think that that's going to be the case. It's the fool's game, right? You've got to take control. You're 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 alone here, right? That's great news because it puts you in the driver's seat. So when it comes to wealth, I mean, that's why for me it starts with gold and silver because what that does for me, Lynette, is like. It gives me confidence, right? Financial confidence. The exactly. same as, you know, I train martial arts. I'm not an aggressive person. I never go, I've never been the kind to go pick a fight, but I like knowing that I'm good in a crisis. Mm -hmm. If ever it should happen, right? I just like having that confidence. I think clear, right? It's that abundant mindset. You know, I'm, I'm yes. more proactive. I'm nicer to people, right? I'm more patient, all this stuff. If I just feel comfortable, like I'm good. They're being an idiot, doesn't matter. I'm good. I know I'm good, right? And I want to feel that way about my bank account. And that starts with that historic store of value, which is gold and silver. It's that, you know, it's that F you money, so to speak. It's that that confidence that just like sits that. there and it's like, I know I'm good, right? That chaos might happen out there, idiots over there, but I'm good. I'm good. And I know I'm good, right? And and from there, you can make far better decisions, right? Thinking long term, not thinking reactive not exactly. responding to whatever happened today because you know like let everybody else get busy right it's right. it's not like that for me yeah exactly you don't have to worry about the gold in your portfolio it's never going to go to zero because it's got the broadest base of buyer and that, that's something that i try and explain to people and you don't hear heard enough in my opinion but when you're looking at fiat money and fiat money assets which are government based monies and government that debt based assets, you know, historically they always go to zero a hundred percent of the time. So, you know, I'm not insane. Well, some might be a little insane, but generally speaking, you know, I'm not going to do the same thing and expect different results. And right. that kind of seems to be a lot of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's any student of history. I don't understand how you could be any student of history. <laughs> And not put some gold in a, in a it's somewhere you know what i mean and um you know recently and maybe you can relate to this i have a lot of friends who don't understand why i would own physical gold like what's the point right this is this is an archaic rock it, it served a purpose at one time but that time has passed right and it's like well what the <laughs> what are you talking about right like this is uh it's, I don't, I don't understand how you can study, study any market cycles, any currency cycles, the rise and fall of any empires, right. And, and not want to have that steadfast. And it's the insurance policy. Like, I don't, to be honest with you, Lynette, is gold going to hit 50,000 in my lifetime? It'd be lovely, but I don't know. And if it doesn't, it honestly doesn't matter. That's the way I approach it. Right. Cause what I buy with the gold is that psychological benefit, right? It's that, that confidence, that sovereign mindset. Exactly. And that's worth every penny. 
honestly, it could go to a trillion dollars. But when it goes to the 50,000, when it goes to a trillion, it's because there's absolutely zero value in the currency and the barter. But here's the beauty part about it. You know, originally in my strategy, I love that you have a strategy and um, that you bring your wife and your kids into that strategy. I mean, I think that's critical. But, you know, I used to think that when we get to the other side of this and there's a component of gold in the new currency to generate confidence in the currency again, because that's what always happens, that I would convert a lot of my holdings into the new currency. But as we're going to CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, I kind of feel differently about that. What do you, what's your opinion on CBDCs? Let's talk about that a little bit. I I think, I think we're likely to end up in a scenario where that's the unit of transaction Mm -hmm. and you'd be a fool to think it's a store of wealth. But if you want to engage (laughs) in, you know, day-to-day commerce that you're, you know, go out for dinner, whatever, hit the grocery store, you're going to use whatever currency that economy supports, right? Whatever country you're in, whatever that is. And you may have to exchange your wealth for that currency. But I would be very, very careful. The same as I own cryptocurrency. I don't, I don't store wealth there, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I've speculated in that market because like anybody, I watch the market activity and decided I wanted a horse in that race. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I'm not leaving wealth there. Not at all, right? And if I make money in the market, I don't leave it. And I, I invest in early stage, right? So like I have sort of the Nassim Taleb barbell approach of super secure uh, hard assets over here, many gold and real estate. And over here, I like the early stage equities and that's the precious metals, explorers, developers, and miners. Um, and if I'm generating profits on the early stage equities side, I'm gonna leave it there, right? I peel those mm-hmm. profits out and contribute that to my war chest, the hard assets, right? And so, that's the foundation, right? And whatever currency our local economy is using on a transaction basis, fine, no worries, right? But uh, I think as I understand it today, that's how I would approach that because what is the CBDC probably gonna be? A surveillance tool that, that also functions as a unit of exchange, right? So, okay, well, that's fine, right? But would I maybe wanna limit my exposure to that surveillance tool? Maybe, right. yeah, probably. Um, you know, what's the counterparty risk to that unit, right? And, and who holds it, right? That's deeply concerning. And we just watched US and Europe confiscate $600 billion of USD reserves. Like, did that not send a message to every central bank in the world that said your, your money's not as safe as you thought it was? That was unprecedented. And is it unwarranted? I'm not going to comment on that. It's a hot war, right? All bets are off. But, you know, the new precedent is if the US decides you're a bad actor at their own discretion, right? That money is no good. It's just, you know what I mean? And I don't think you and I are any different, to be honest with you. No, well, Canada just did something similar to that not that long ago with the trucker strike. You're absolutely right. And that is like, that is horrifying because- <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, they, they could do some deep dives and maybe uncover some nefarious actors and all this stuff. But what about the, the 18 year old who's a bit rebellious like we all were who decided that's a cause I want to get behind and they sent a hundred bucks, you know, as a donation, their account got frozen and now they're, they're on a list. Right. And they were just growing up. They were just caught up, you know, and it's, and, and they've been bundled and labeled and punished and it's horrifying. Right. That's, that's a very strong message that everybody should be paying attention to. Exactly. So it's easy for, to look at it and go, that's at the country level. Oh, that couldn't happen. But you know, Canada is such a close neighbor to America, the U.S. rather. And, yeah. you know, and we just saw it on an individual level. And it, it's kind of hard to get a lot of uh, data. Have They say that those accounts have been unfrozen, but I'm also hearing that a lot of it has not worked back through the system for um, that the people have access to their... And, and, and just as importantly, like, we tend to look at those as static events, right? Oh, that's something that happened on that day. It's, it's always a precedent, right? It's always part of a trajectory. So what direction is that trajectory moving? Because next time point. it's going to require less of an event, right? Once precedent set, same as, as US yes. and, and Europe confiscating that 600 billion. I was just like, it's always as hard as the first time. The first it's easier time, the right. second time. And QE. Right? 
right? That was the first time that they started doing that. That was the hardest yeah. time. Now it's it's become a normal monetary policy tool, except it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. We make the mistake of, of, of asking like, what just happened instead of what's gonna happen next, right? right? Like, what is this the stepping stone to? Because it's always a stepping stone to something, right? What is it a stepping stone to? This first action that we're watching right now, right? What, what doors yeah. do it, does it open? So what, what do you think it's a stepping stone to? I think more government intervention in our private lives. I mean, that's as a yeah. Canadian, like I, I, like I said, the, the scariest part about that to me was like, you know, it was wrong for a handful of reasons, but I kept on thinking about my friends who have 16 and 17 year old kids who, who got wrapped up in this and, and uh, donated some cash because they were like, hell yeah, I want to get behind, right? The, the working, right? The blue collar right. worker of this country, right? right? Which is something I think was amazing. And, and it, you know, nothing, by the way, Canada nothing really makes illegal, headlines. Was it? Nothing that, that they did was actually illegal. No, no, no. no of I course thought. not. No, yeah. no, no, no. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch how this folds, how, how it plays out. I mean, I've never seen Canada become so united simultaneously divided, but like it was one of the most unifying events um, that I witnessed as a Canadian in the last 30 plus years. Can you talk about that a little bit more deeply? How did it unify, unify everybody? How did it help the knowledge base of people? I mean, did it wake people up and what, what are you seeing? Yeah, okay, so I, I should preface that by saying it. <laughs> I think it unified a massive population who suddenly felt the pain, right? And, and could rally behind this movement that was making headlines all over the world, right? That, you know, a core industry of Canada's economy was taking a stand. And this wasn't some financial elite. This was, you know, the blue collar behind the scenes worker, right? Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, Lynette, like, as you could imagine, it also divided the country simultaneously because everything divides these days. It's like, as soon as an event happens, we're supposed to pick a team, right? right. This or that, right? But, you know, it was like, this is going to sound silly, but there were moments where I was walking down the street during that convoy when it was headed to Ottawa and when it landed. And the sentiment on the sidewalk was similar to the 2010 uh, Winter Olympics that we hosted in, in Canada, in Vancouver, right? And I say that to mean like there were Canadian flags everywhere. When a flag would drive past the sidewalk, the people on the sidewalk would cheer. Like, there was community wow. and enthusiasm at a yeah. level that was like reminiscent of when we hosted the Olympics. Um, and it's funny that it took an event like this, but yeah, numerous times I'll be walking down the street and just watch these eruptions of applause and support, you know, from people that didn't know each other from Adam that were bonding together over something that they, they felt a certain way about. And, and uh, it's, it was neat to watch. Yeah. I bet you that had to have scared the government though. Well, I, <laughs> I, I would say it for sure did. I mean, it was, you know, a week later that all these mandates dropped in Canada and, and the establishment claims there was no relationship. Okay. It was just coincidence then, <laughs> like a week later. Oh. Yeah. Well, Jay, how many coincidences does it take until you realize it's not a coincidence? Yeah. I mean, crisis after crisis after crisis to keep people off balance. Is it a yeah. coincidence? I'll right. Let, I'll let everybody right. out there decide. Yeah. You know, I know what I think. I don't think there's that many coincidences, but it goes back to your personal sovereignty, doesn't it? Yeah, I and believe so. It's it's a it's a it's a peaceful approach, you know, I, I think to understand that it's just you. Like it's it it's very important. Like so when I talk about my 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 parenting blueprint for example, that my wife and I put together Right. We talk about like, what are the core values? If we succeed as parents, what are the values that our kids have that we've instilled upon them? And, you know, creativity is number one. It's an asset that'll thrive in any economy situation, right? Confidence, because without confidence, you may never put that creativity into the world. Number three is resilience. Resilience, as it means, as it, as we translate it, is the relationship between hard work and reward, right? How do you understand suffering with purpose, right? The importance of doing hard things. And, and so we landed on resilience for that. And then, you know, my, the fourth would be, would be giving back, right? Paying it forward if you've been fortunate enough to succeed in this life. But, you know, all of that, I think it, I hope, we hope it sets you up, right? To carve your own path without any reliance or independence because 
Like if, if you're running a surplus, if you succeed financially, then, then you can give back to whoever you want to, right? If you're running a deficit and you're dependent, you don't have a choice. You know what I mean? Right. And um, yeah. Well, those are great core values. And I really admired you before, but after hearing this, I admire you so much more <laughs> because it's not just for your children, but it's also for all of us. And I, I, I if you were here, you would know this, but creativity to me is the key as well because it's the it enables you to solve any problem. There are no problems. There are just opportunities to come up with another solution so that you keep going. And we're facing something that is really massive because well, I don't know um, how you feel about it. So you can... You know, you, you can, you don't always have to agree with me, right? Sure. But sure. there's not one doubt in my mind. And also it's out there all the time. I've been talking about a reset since 2009 when Christine Lagarde had a Bloomberg interview. It's probably a half an hour interview. And she probably used the word reset. We have to reset this. We have to reset that at least 27 times. And they've subsequently taken it down. But, um, you know, really, I think it's critical for us to to be creative because we've got these problems that are not going to go away because there's an agenda to drive us into a big enough crisis so that they can push this next thing down our throats and remain in power, right? But that also takes us to I think another very important core value that you mentioned too, and that's the community part and the paying it forward. And I'd like you to expound on that because I know that you're part of a very, or you support a very important cause and it's even bigger than that. So I'm going to let you talk about it though. Oh, that's cool. Um, you're referring to zero ceiling. I, believe. I am. That's, that's awesome. Thanks for bringing that up. Lynette. It's so yeah, it's, it's a, uh, Super cool initiative, actually local, right in, in the town where I live. I live 45 minutes north of Vancouver in a little town called Squamish. And, and um, <clears throat> Zero Sailing, their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas. And then they buy them with just positive influences in their life. Um, you know, I'm really fortunate, Lynette, and that I get to connect with people like you. I get to connect with all the keynote speakers at my conferences, mm -hmm. all the guests on my podcast. You know, a common thread that I pick up on all the successful individuals that I get the honor of speaking to is that they want to pay it forward, right? Mm -hmm. They recognize that they were mentored or they were counseled or advised or had a positive influence somewhere along the way. And so once they quote unquote made it, you know, they want to give it back, right? They want to pay it down to the next generation. And so I've been watching this and wondering, you know, what, what kind of like pairing could I make, right? Um, between, you know, my network of, of successful individuals and, you know, a generation that maybe could use some counsel, right? Specifically, like an underserved population in urban right. centers. And, you know, I was really lucky at 18. I, I left Vancouver, moved to a town of 42 people, literally 42, and <laughs> lots of wild animals, very few human beings. And, and the natural habitat was just such a blessing to me because I was, oh, it a, is. you know, I had a lot of misspent energy when I was a youth, you know, and and um, and made some poor choices and and getting the opportunity to relocate myself just randomly to uh, you know a very you know um, remote wild environment was just a huge blessing and and allowed me to like think outside the box most importantly mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. like I grew up with all these rules right in in the city you know here's how life is here's what life should be here's here's morality here's ethics here's law all of this stuff right here's what relationships are all of this and and then you know, separating myself from that, you realize all these rules are imaginary. They were just created by somebody else, just like me. So why am I believing them to be gospel when they're not, right? It's just, it's just foolishness. And so anyways, all that to say, if I could find a way to, to give that gift, the gift of, of, you know, wild places with the gift of mentorship, you know, it just struck me as a, a good cause that I could do off the side of my desk. And that's when I found Zero Ceiling, who's doing half of that work already. Right. They're taking they're taking kids out of urban centers, pretty tough situations. I mean, all of us were pushed to a brink of some kind. Right. During right. during the last two years. Oh, yeah. Lots of stress, definitely. unpredictability, you know, so and I'm in a pretty good spot and I felt myself pushed to the brink. Right. So my brink's different. But 
that 15 year old kid who's already homeless. I mean, their brink's a lot different than mine. And so you can imagine some of the scenarios that, that uh, unfolded over the last two years. And so, yeah, to play a role in that org, we donate all of our YouTube ad revenue to that organization and help, you know, facilitate more housing and, and uh, employment training, most importantly. Um, and, and just, you know, a lot of counseling, right. And therapy, just a lot of trauma. Right. So, but it's a, it's a rad organization. Yeah. Super, super blessed to be part so of that. Is it, is it throughout Canada? Is it in America? Is it anywhere else? Cause that sounds like a phenomenal cause. And I work with CFLA, which is, this, it doesn't take them out of the home or, or put them in the country. But again, it's definitely high risk youth and that's our future. I mean, our future is the youth. So. Yeah. Yeah. Zero ceiling, super local. You know, I, I, I decided to sort of cut my teeth in the philanthropic world with this organization because when I approached them and I said, you know, I, I'd like to contribute in a little, in, in a certain way. And what I want in exchange is utter transparency into the organization, right? I want to know exactly how you operate, how the money's spent, you know, who the employees are, what happens to the kids post program, right? Who gets in, who doesn't get in all of this stuff, because it's not my world, you know, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't specialize in nonprofits at all um, or social work for that matter. And so, right. you know, why zero ceiling struck me is like, wow, you're just like a really small group of incredibly hardworking and passionate individuals doing some of the most important work on the planet. And, um, and uh, yeah, if I can just play a role here and then get full transparency and understand what the main pain points are. Right. And maybe bring some capitalism to the nonprofit sector. I don't know, but you know, down the road, we'll see what happens there. Well, it seems to me like what you're really talking about here is community. And I think that of the mantra, you know, my personal mantra, food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth, preservation, community, and shelter. Yes. Community is probably, uh, or arguably, I'd say the most important piece of it. And that's what you do with actually, I think, um, pretty much all of your work, right? All the you know, all the symposiums that you put together and the people that you talk to, isn't that building community? Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, we build the tribe, you know, and it, it's lacking, isn't it, Lynette? Like it's, <laughs> um, it's funny, right? Like, you know, I live in a great neighborhood, good neighbors, young kids, my kids age, great, great bond, all this stuff. And I, I do feel like we have a bit of a village concept, which I love so much. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, if I was hit by a bus tomorrow, is anybody going to step up and take care of my family? Probably not, right? Probably right. not. So I have to pay a third party, right? Every month I send them some money as a just in case I get hit by a bus, right? Like how, how alien is that, right? That that's where we're at. And I get it, right? It's, it's, uh, it's necessary, but you know, it, it speaks to the disconnect on a human to human basis right now that I, I ship money off on a monthly basis to some third party organization that I don't know anybody at, right? So that my family's taken care of if I get smoked out, right? And uh, trust me that the bigger insurance policy is, is in a safe somewhere, but <laughs> but uh, you're right, yeah, it's- But let's, let's kind of expand that because, um, I mean, do you agree or you could disagree that we are, I mean, that we are inside of a currency, well, social, economic, and financial reset into a, a whole different system. You might not think so. Social, economic, and financial reset? Mm -hmm. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, so, do you think, what, what do you think about that? Do you think that's where we're headed or what we're already participating in? I think on a social level, I'm seeing society breakdown in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And this manifests in just a complete and utter allergic reaction to civil discourse and tolerant debate, um, civil divisions that are just irreparable. And so on social level, I would agree. I think that things break before they, they repair. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I, I think we're watching that right now. And it's a, it's a pretty hard thing to watch. Um, I think that anybody watching this has experienced some strain on relationships, maybe that they have never experienced before in the last two years, because everything became so polarizing, right? Yes, and you, you're this team or that team. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, is society breaking in a sense? Like, yeah, I'd say hundred percent, but economic, probably, probably. I, I don't have as much clarity on that one. I think that, 
you know, if you just look at the decoupling between the financial markets and the real economy, you have to say, yeah, right? This isn't working anymore, right? And people are getting poor, items are getting more expensive, right? Like inflation starting to really pinch, right? And we've been talking about it for a long time, but it's happening now, right? And, um, you know, what's the solution here? Because what do they say? There's, there's nine meals between uh, civility and riots, right? Or nine meals between civil, civility and anarchy, right? That's the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm That's not I'm very watching... many meals. No, but, you know, like, yeah, yeah. 100%. But and people that are hungry and hopeless make choices they would not otherwise make. The rules change based on your circumstance mm -hmm. and you can't fault anybody for it, right? We're going to take care of ourselves and our, our families, right? And, and I guess getting back to all those rules, they're all imaginary. If they're not working for you. You're going to make new ones, you know? And, and um, I guess I think of this decade, shorter answer to your question, balance of it, the remainder of the 2020s are going to be like the 2020s have been, right? More chaos, more uncertainty right? And uh, more civil unrest. And if we thought that the riots and protests in response to, you know, health mandates were big, just wait, right? Like oh, yeah. the largest wheat exporters in the world aren't going to be exporting any wheat and they're not going to be planting. There's no seeding season, no harvest season. The, the product's offline. Exactly. Right? And that's food. That's food. That's right. Food. That's food. Yeah. I mean, we're just, we're just getting into it. I believe I don't yeah. enjoy saying that. And I hope I'm wrong. I just don't. I don't see it any other way, right? We're removing the product from the, the world global market. Yeah, and uh, you know, we've been taught, I mean, it used to be people used to have victory gardens and that's how they fed themselves. And I think we all need to have victory gardens again. Um, and that goes back to communities so people can come together. But the food is, it's always too the single biggest issue as we go through these transitions but now it's essentially the food supply is being cut off for most people. I mean, this is why I started, you know, my urban farm was because yeah. I knew that food was the single biggest issue for people as we go through these transitions. And um, I'll tell you what, in, in March and April of 2020, in the last couple of years, I've been so thankful that I had planted all of these gardens. And I'm not a gardener. I don't pretend to be. I am. I am a gentleman farmer because I have other right. people that do the physical labor, but yeah. I understood the importance of it. And I, yeah. I don't know how many people exactly that I can feed, but I can feed a whole lot more than, than just me mm. or me and my family, you know? So yeah, the, the social fiber of the world is really shifting right now and has been well and we take a lot of things for granted right yeah don't we you know maybe it's unrealistic that in the pacific northwest i have ripe bananas 12 months of the year maybe that's not a realistic expectation that i have and i think a lot of these systems are being reset right to your point yes exactly so what you're talking about is eating with the seasons right you grow it that's that's actually um I can't say that I do that 100%, but I could do it 100%. I would say that I probably do that about 85 to 90%. And I really, That's amazing. yeah, well, you know, when is the time to do something? It's before you need it. It's called yeah. preparation. Yeah. yeah. You know, and the worst thing that happens if you get fully prepared food, water, energy, security, barter, ability, wealth, preservation, community, and shelter. That's what you need no matter what's going on to have a reasonable standard of living as we go through this whole shift. You know, I mean, I'll tell you the truth, and I'd like to know your opinion of this, but the World Economic Forum and everything that they're standing for and trying to push down our throats, um, yeah, that's a little troubling to me. Right. Yeah. You will own nothing and be happy. What do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand that concept, to be honest, Lynette, the whole, I guess, idea of modern monetary theory, right? And what this means and, <laughs> and what it means in terms of like ownership over money, right? Which I think is kind of at the core of it as I'm beginning to understand this. I find it very complex and just foreign, philosophically different from how we think about transaction value and everything. But 
you know, that's, that's kind of at the core of it, right? You're almost relinquishing your control and your ownership oh. over money and units of exchange entirely. And, and, you know, and everything. I mean, if you buy your own house and you ultimately pay it off, well, in Victorian times, they always had the newel post from the uh, stairway was hollow. And the part on the top could come off. And when the mortgage was paid off, they had a huge party and they buried that mortgage, the paid mm. off mortgage inside of that newel post. And then they glued the top back on. Huh. And so I then that, that house could be passed down from generation to generation to generation. And so you had no mortgage. And I can tell you in the neighborhood, because it's an old neighborhood that I live in for Phoenix, not for many other parts of the world. But like yeah. this yeah. neighbor was, neighborhood was basically built in the 20s and 30s, or mostly built. Okay. Uh, there are people in this neighborhood that have inherited this property from from their grandparents, their parents, and now, so there's three or more mm. generations that have lived in that house. Okay, if you're a perpetual renter, who gets to choose what that rent is? And I think what they're really taking us back to are feudal times, where you just had one big landlord, and that person owned everything, and then everybody else worked for that person. So mm. I think we're coming full circle. That's what I see. And that I think is what it's about. You will own nothing, but somebody owns everything. Yeah. 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 And, and the path between this and that is this, I guess, forward March to just a wider wealth gap, yes. wider spread poverty yes. through inflation essentially right you get people in a vulnerable enough state you can do anything if your promise in return is we'll support you and provide for you right right and this is in your best interest this is the path towards stability right stability is Who's a core stability? human need. what's that Who's stability well yeah i think it's uh it's going to be the pr message right it, that is exactly the PR. I mean, what do you want to own something for? Oh, it's a pain in the neck when you want to sell it and you have to yeah. keep it up. And hey, if you're renting, you can move whenever you want. Look at all of this freedom. Don't yeah. own anything. Own the experience, except somebody owns everything. Yeah. Which is like, I mean, it's just this massive push for me to double down on the sovereign mindset strategy because voila and I just get back to like mental health right you I operate better I make better decisions I'm a kinder person if I have options right if I have exactly. options you know what I mean and how do you retain optionality right well number of ways but you need some some wealth off the grid right something yep. you own right there yeah no exactly. counterparty risk and no what that really risk. means, yeah. can you explain counterparty risk? Because I do get that question often enough. Um, and I would like your explanation of what is counterparty risk? Well, it's whoever's holding the other side of the trade. That's how I would explain it, right? And so, you know, there's zero counterpart counterparty risk with an ounce of gold because that ounce of gold sits in Lynette's desk. No one else has any claim to it. You can put it in your pocket, take it wherever you want, right? Exactly. And it's your property, right? And, um, you know, there aren't very many alternative assets that retain that. I suppose you could make the argument about real estate, but I think through, you couldn't, I suppose, just do basic taxation policy. And, exactly. And, um, you know, and what you is true? And you can't put a house in your pocket. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> well, it's yeah. big. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, how do how do you explain Lynette when somebody with zero expertise in the gold market and they don't understand, right? If you if you've never experienced anything but the last 15, 20 years, like there's, it's hard to understand the utility of owning gold, right? And do you have a simple, simple lesson or a simple experience or a simple event that you point people to to say? You don't understand gold, consider this, right? Is there 
I, you know, I really, I come back to this all the time because I hear so few people ever talk about it. And it does go back to the utility of this asset because it's used in jewelry making, it's used in the financial system, it's used in, in, in um, manufacturing, it's used in electronics, it's used in food, it's used in every single area of the global economy. You hold it, you own it outright, but it has the broadest base of functionality and the broadest base of demand. Mm. Tell me of anything that you know that can claim that. Yeah, not nearly with as much diverse utility, right? To your point about just, yeah, storage, transportation, et cetera, zero counterparty, meaning there's no other party with their fingers on that asset. There's no other party that can manipulate that asset, tax that asset, modify the price of that asset, the value, I should say, of that asset. Yeah. Right. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with what the U.S. did in the war with Russia and what Canada did in the war with the truckers, yeah. right? I mean, if everything you hold is counterparty risk, so it's in the system, I mean, what do you do when the system says no? Yeah. So, I mean, following that thread, Lynette, like, are you seeing a shift right now from capital and energy and attention on the paper gold market transition to the physical gold market. And I feel like I am, and maybe even starting with central banks, right? Repatriate, repatriation of, of, of physical gold, right? Countries yeah, all over Europe. Right, that, that's been happening for a little while now, the repatriation. And, and look at, let's just talk about Russia for a minute because they had been divesting themselves from dollars and accumulating gold. And the gold that they hold in their country, that's theirs. And they've been utilizing that to get around all the sanctions. The gold that they held and the, and the reserves that they held outside of the country, mm. gone. Yeah. To your point, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it really is simple. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. And a piece of paper that says you own X, Y, Z, no, 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 no. What you have is you have a bunch of equity that can be used by whoever's holding it yeah. for their benefit. And they can even use that same equity over if it's done through the city of London. So hypothecation and rehypothecation an unlimited number of times that sure. same equity can be used. So going into the collapse, what do you end up with? If that's where your wealth is. Yeah. Bunch of pieces of paper. Yeah. Posters. So, to your point earlier too, I have hope because just like those people were cheering the truckers and the movement and coming together, more in this high inflation or the obviously high inflation is opening up a lot of people's eyes. The heavy handedness of the global government. So I don't think there's any place that's immune from that. I mean, Australia has been horrendous to their public. The every, they all have, they've been usurping our freedoms. Mm. You know, my hope and what I, Think, I mean, what we have a shot at is enough people coming together and then saying no, but you have to be independent. You made such a good point. What, what this does, what this does is it gives you choices. Yeah. And that's not a novel concept, is it? That's a return to the norm, right? We're, we, we kid ourselves with our suits and ties and fancy cars. We're still just wild animals who grew up a little bit. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, like, true we're not nearly as sophisticated as we like to think we are you know and and it's always been like that and you know it's 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 it shouldn't be a foreign concept to think that you have to take care of yourself right it is up right. to you right that's the norm that's 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 human beings that's what life is right and right. also it's good news it's not bad news right i love it's not that. bad news it puts you in the driver's seat right you get to make the choices 
life shouldn't be easy, right? Like it's a, it's a jungle out there. We're just monkeys in here, like trying to make the best of it, you know, and <laughs> roll up your sleeves and get to work. <laughs> Absolutely. That's such a good point. I mean, we, we are, we're just, we're doing the best that we can, but I love it when you're independent and it's all what you choose to do, then you're driving your own ship. If somebody else is driving it, they're going to take you in their direction that yeah. they want you to go in. You need to yeah. be able to take yourself and your family and those people that you care about in the direction yeah. that you and, believe. And I think there's a way, there's an awakening occurring, right? Yes. And it's, you know, I'm seeing this in the growth of channels like mine. Like why, why have, you know, why have, why has my audience grown the way it has over the last 18 months and a million of my peers, the exact same thing, right? Because yes. people are starting to ask questions. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Why is this happening? Right. And there's this, this thirst for knowledge about why the world functions the way it does. And, um, you know, pros and cons to that, right. It's, it's an abundance of people seeking out informative headlines and, you know, the, the media is not always great at informing people, it's great at distracting <laughs> them and misleading them. Right. So that's a lot their of, job. It is their job, right? It is absolutely right. And, and so I think you just have to be wary of that. Right. And mm -hmm. like, I make a point and this frustrates the heck out of my audience sometimes, to be honest with you, but I'll have on guests that I agree with and guests that I disagree with. And, right. You know, my, my newsletter, like the core focus of it is to question everything. And, and I don't write it for anybody but myself. You know, I, I write every week, I write the letter that I need to read. You know what I mean? Like it's, if I'm struggling it's with fabulous. something, if I'm trying to understand something, I'll, I'll write the letter about that. Or if I'm, if I'm feeling offended or triggered by something, I'll write the letter about that. So it helps me flush it out and process it. And if it helps other people, awesome. But, you know, it's, it's amazing how not taking a side can offend people these days. And it's, you know, it's like, if you're just trying to play the middle ground and understand things and hear both perspectives and, and weigh the options and, and try to remove blind spots, it's, it's offensive often to individuals who just want you to join a team and, 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 uh, you know, if there's an economic, financial, and social reset, there's definitely a media reset occurring right now. That's what I believe. Oh, you think so? I mean, <laughs> you know, we're we're supposed to be have freedom of speech, but um, yeah, there's not a lot of that that's happening, and we've even been put in a position where we have to self. I, I can. I don't know about you, but for me, unfortunately, there are some things that I definitely do self censor. Hundred percent too. But yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, if I want to stay on air and be of value, then there are some things I just can't really talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a, a pre-huddle on our YouTube uh, interviews, certain buzzwords you just can't say. You exactly. Know? And uh, that's horrible. That, that really is. Game. Yeah. We, we've covered a lot of ground. I could keep going on and on, yeah. but... Is there anything that you feel we need to discuss here that the viewers need to be paying attention to? I know you have the event coming up, so I'd really like you to talk about that as well. Certainly, I, I can start with that. Thank you, by the way, and thanks for that. It's, it's and all be... the links are below, so for anybody that, okay. it's coming up really quickly, though. Next week, yeah, Tuesday and Wednesday, it's the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, and this is like everything I do, it's, it's built to answer the questions that I have on that. And so, Love it. you know, individuals joining me on stage are, we've got the former prime minister of Canada, the 22nd prime minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, um, the 63rd president of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, both of whom, the reason I wanted those two is they managed their countries through the 2008 financial crisis. The last time the whole world was wondering what's the future of the U S dollar. Right. And so they were having those conversations with George Bush at that time. And you know, Excellent. love or hate our politicians, they have unique perspectives on what's occurring. And mm -hmm. any leader of a G7 or G20 nation is going to have unique perspectives. So, you know, squaring off with those two individuals is going to be a ton of fun. Um, a handful of, you know, the, the macro thought leaders that I really lean on and a handful that I, don't, that I disagree with, right? Both from the inflation and deflation camps, right? Strong dollar, weak dollar camps. And, you know, my ambition with this event is to provide as much perspective, as many strategies as possible so that our audience can leave with just a, an abundance of ideas and then take from that which works, which works for them, right? Because it's everyone's got a different risk tolerance, investable capital, time horizon. There's no template copy and paste strategy. It just doesn't exist. So 
hear as many perspectives as possible. And, uh, and then 230 junior mining companies on the floor. So if you're looking at that market as, as I am, you know, it's a great place to meet the CEOs before you let them have an adventure with your cash. You should always meet the management teams behind those small companies. And um, otherwise, I'm at the Jay Martin Show, YouTube, podcast. Um, I publish everything there, publish my weekly newsletter. Again, it's the favorite thing that I do. And I just share thoughts on whatever's catching my attention. Well, I think we're really lucky that you're participating in this. And I mean, this is a big collective We I have a lot of respect and admiration for you, Jay. I really do. I really appreciate that, Lynette. It's a two-way street. Super grateful for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here. And to all of the links are below. So if you can get to Vancouver on Tuesday, Wednesday, you should do it. Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Yeah, May 17th and 18th. That's perfect. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.